I love the word mensch. Just like a lot of Yiddish, there isn't an exact translation that suffices, but it means doing the right thing, being a good person, thinking of yourself in the context of the bigger picture. And I think as the world is becoming more and more 24 seven, more distractions, more forces coming at us trying to influence us. And as the world problems are getting more complicated, we need more menches. And then about a year ago, I learned that there's this huge resurgence happening right now, all around these ancient insights and ideas and traditions. Tradition! That are so relevant today because they're all about how to be more of a mensch. A mensch is a lady or gent who would help any friend at the soonest request. And they gladly accept lipstick stains on her cheeks from the kisses that Bubby gives best. A mensch. A mensch. My definition of being a mensch. See, a mensch holds the door and takes part in the horror while giving out mazels with ease. A person who does good deeds when other people aren't looking. And a mensch wipes the floor if you spill all your borscht and gazum tights at everyone's sneeze. People that have uh, good uh, standards, uh, ethical standards. Now, in some ways, my team and I have been studying what I will call here menschiology for a while. We just didn't realize it. We had made this film called The Science of Character about this fascinating research that identified universal virtues that people across cultures and history agree lead to a good life. And that there are 24 character strengths that when practiced could lead to those virtues. And after the film premiered, all these Jewish educators and rabbis were like, this is great, but why didn't you mention Musar? And I was like, Mus what? I felt like such a bad Jew. But apparently, Musar is like this ancient Jewish science of character. So if the science proves we can develop who we are, Musar offers the tools to help you do that. And these tools can apply to anyone, religious to atheist, Jewish or not. I mean, I'm not religious, but I love the traditions, the questioning, the humor, the holidays that are like, they failed to kill us, let's eat. So perhaps that explains why I didn't know about Musar. But then I discovered some of my favorite thinkers around character were Jews, and they didn't mention Musar either. Now they weren't professional Jews, but still, I was hooked. I had to find out more about Musar. It turns out it has this amazing history. The ideas go as far back as the Bible, but really started to take shape in the 10th and 11th centuries, when Jewish philosophers started cherry picking the best ideas from all of Jewish wisdom about living with meaning and purpose. Rav Sayadia, for example. It's pronounced Rav Sadia. Got it, thanks. Published a chapter called How a Person Ought to Behave in the World. By the way, figuring out which cherries to put on the tree with my spectacular cadre of rabbis was very Talmudic. And Rabbi Baha Ibn Pekwada. That's Bahia Ibn Pekuda. Wrote Duties of the Heart, the first systematic overview of Jewish ethics. 900 years later, as the Jews of Europe were being tormented by pogroms, and many were considering converting or assimilating, a Lithuanian rabbi, Yisrael Salanter, looked through the growing collection around living an ethical, meaningful life and published rituals and practices that would help people fulfill that path. He also republished some of the classics and turned Musar into a movement. The Musar movement thrived for many decades. People lived it. Working on themselves was part of the language and culture until the Holocaust. The Musar movement slowed and almost disappeared. Until now, as we plow through the 21st century, Musar is coming back. Right at the same time that similar conversations around character are emerging from all sectors of society. So in Musar's framework, instead of character strengths, Musar calls these qualities midot. And we're each made up of dozens, if not hundreds of midot. But with the help of a few rabbis, we fit them nicely into our periodic table. And now I'm sounding like a rabbi, but I'm definitely not. These midot aren't necessarily good or bad. They're all important parts of who we are. Even qualities like envy. Some envy can motivate you to work harder or impatience. Sometimes in the face of injustice, you need more impatience. It's not about ridding yourself of any of these qualities, because that would be virtually impossible. Musar is about creating rituals and practices that help you better control or develop different qualities. For example, say you want to increase your sense of gratitude. 
which there's so much research today saying that if you feel more grateful, you're gonna be healthier, you're gonna have more mental strength, and you're gonna sleep better. So this practice on gratitude is based on the Jewish tradition of 100 blessings a day. My good friend Amichai first taught me about it. Every day, one gets to say 100 blessings. Everything from waking up first thing in the morning, to the big moments, to all the little moments. But also, when you go to the bathroom. That's the Jewish way, 100 blessings every day. Do I say them? I try. And I love this part. At the end of the day as you're going to sleep, instead of looking at your screen, Close your eyes and think about all those moments, all those things you're grateful for. Or another classic Musar practice is from Maimonides. Instead of giving, let's say, $100 to one organization or person, every day you would give $1 to a different person who needs it for 100 days. So it's working on the muscle of generosity so over time you will be more generous to others. Regardless of how you do it, this type of repetition is key to Musar. Or as the yogis will tell you, it's all about the practice. Even neuroscience now proves that focus and repetition strengthen pathways in the brain to make the action easier over time. So one way people do this is to choose a particular quality and focus on it for a season at a time, or a month, or a week. Like Benjamin Franklin, he created a chart of 13 virtues and focused on each one for a week at a time. He'd mark every time he faulted and tracked his progress over 50 years. And no, he's not Jewish, if you're wondering. He was not Franklin's time. <laughs> Franklin Inski. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> but I did hear that his ideas had some influence on Musar practices. So, an honorary Jew. While for Franklin, this was an individual practice, Musar also suggests that doing a practice with someone else or a group really helps. And apparently, I've been doing a practice with a group, and I didn't even know it. Several years ago, I was starting to feel like life was happening too fast like there wasn't a moment to be present. So my family and I reimagined the weekly Shabbat ritual in a way that would speak to those needs. We decided to turn off all screens for 24 hours every week. And doing this for the past five years has had such an incredible impact on us. I think that's why I've been so excited to learn about all these other practices I can try. They're all about reminding us to think of ourselves in the context of the bigger picture. Alan Marinus, the founder of the Musar Institute, writes a lot about humility. He's known, along with Rabbi Ira Stone, to be responsible for the modern Musar movement. So Marinus writes, humility is limiting oneself to an appropriate amount of space while leaving room for others, which is something I think about a lot and wrestle with. I feel like, as a woman, women were left off of so many history books for their contributions, so on the one hand, I feel like it's my duty to represent but I also don't want to take up too much space. So whenever I do something public, I have things I do to try to keep it in check. Okay, that's not actually what I do for my practice, but you could. But there is one humility practice you could start the next time you're in a group setting. If you're more of a vocal person like me, try to let everyone else speak before you. And if you're more of a quiet person, try to be the first one to speak. There's a powerful Jewish story about the relationship between humility and courage. Each person carries two notes, one in each pocket. One note says, the whole entire world was made for me. And the other note says, I am only dust and ashes. So basically knowing when to summon up courage and when to be humble. And here's perhaps my favorite part of Musar. You create your own path. I like to think of it as code, your own personal mensch code, looking at your patterns and creating your own system of practices that works for you. It's like we're each the captain of our own small sailboats, wrestling with all these different elements within us and around us. And we have to keep reading the wind and deciding when to pull in the sails and when to let them out and when to change directions. And there are always gonna be things we have no control over, unforeseen obstacles, or even how long the ride is gonna be. But we can adjust the sails. So as the world needs more menches, and we're all responsible for our own path, we need to ask ourselves, what qualities do I wanna work on? What kind of person do I wanna be? Someone who dedicates their time to do good. <laughs>
Someone who's honest. And is loyal to their friends. Someone who shows gratitude and shows good honor. They respect their parents. They have good posture, I guess. You're a family who can do with each Loving to others. And a generous person to everyone they meet. He is really nice. Someone who puts others before themselves. And is very often righteous. So what do we need to do to get there? As my mother used to say, a mensch is a mensch. Oh, hey, you could be a mensch too. I said, hey, you could be a mensch too. Hey, you could be a mensch too. I said, hey, you could be a mensch too. All I wish is for menchiness. I said, all I want in life is your menchiness. Oh, all I wish.